Space School is one of the world's first digitally filmed live-action full-dome films. It focuses on the ways in which astronauts are trained underwater here on Earth for work and life in space. As an underwater cinematographer, the fun of making Space School for me was combining what I love to do, which is underwater cinematography, with what the market kind of likes, which is space. But I have to admit that we have an ulterior motive. Is we're trying to convince the industry that underwater topics really look good on the dome. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird, and welcome to my world. Jonathan Bird, the director and DP of Space School, is the host and producer of Jonathan Bird's Blue World, an underwater educational adventure program on PBS. He wanted to move his exciting family-friendly brand onto the big screen, but before production could begin on the film, there were huge technical hurdles. When we started pre-production on the film in 2013, I was convinced that the 4K cameras that were on the market had enough uh, quality and capability to pull off dome films. But, you know, just to be sure, we thought we should run a screen test. So uh, I called up my friend Mauricio Handler, who owns a red with an underwater housing. He has a scarlet. And we went down to the Bahamas to do some test footage with some great hammerhead sharks just for fun. That was my first introduction to the red as a camera system. And we got to play with it underwater. We shot some sharks. And Skyscan had taken some interest in the project, and they were willing to project the stuff that we shot on the dome to help us determine if it was going to work for a dome film or not. Not. Shooting great hammerhead sharks as a test subject in the Bahamas was fun. And back at Skyscan, on the dome it looked pretty good, but it was clear that 4K didn't have enough resolution. The initial tests in 4K were encouraging, but we realized we needed a sharper lens and we needed more resolution. My opinion was that 5K was not enough, so the Red Epic wasn't quite going to be enough resolution. But at the time, they had just announced the Dragon, which was 6K, and it would be released soon. So the Dragon was where we were focusing our efforts. We had to figure out how to get our hands on a Dragon. When the Dragon finally became available, the production sprang into action. Fortunately, the exterior design of the Dragon was nearly the same as the Epic, so an underwater housing for the Epic would also fit the Dragon. Finding a housing wasn't too hard, but getting permission from NASA to film astronauts was another matter. For Jonathan Bird's Blue World, we had filmed at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston, and we did a really good segment. I think they liked us, and it was really no trouble to get back in there. When we called them, actually, our medicals were still current. So getting into NBL wasn't a problem, but the NEMO missions were a little bit more complicated. The NEMO missions are very, very busy at Aquarius. The staff is, is booked, the boats are full, and there's a huge bunch of people doing all kinds of work and the last thing they needed was some film crew coming in and sticking cameras in their faces so it took a little bit more convincing uh, to get them to go along with it and eventually it was actually the Aquarius director who promised to keep us out of their hair I think that convinced them to do it so in the end we did get permission and I hope now that the film is out they're thinking that it was worth it. One of the things that separates Space School from older live-action dome films is not just the 6K resolution, but the frame rate. We shot Space School at 60 frames per second, which has sort of become the standard for CGI full dome films because it's more lifelike than the lower frame rates of the film days. And when you look at other live-action films that were shot on 70 millimeter film and brought over to the full dome theaters, they look kind of old and dated because that 24 frame per second film frame rate is kind of juddery and it's okay for drama it's okay for you know separating reality from fiction it it it, it makes a good movie but for a full dome experience when you want the audience to feel like you they're really there nothing beats high frame rates so when you put the detail of 6K resolution combined with the amazing lifelike 60 frame per second experience, you get a dome film that is just like being there. When you watch Space School, you're going to feel like you're underwater with the astronauts. But all that realism comes with a price. Handling the Dragon footage was not academic. The sheer volume 
of data that comes out of a red dragon shooting at 6K 60P is astonishing. We were using 256 gigabyte cards. That's a quarter of a terabyte per card. And the camera would go through one of those cards in 30 minutes. It takes longer to copy the footage to a computer than it takes to actually shoot the footage. We shot about 36 hours of footage for the film and that took 18 terabytes of drive. So we came home from every shoot with a stack of hard drives full of footage. To edit the sheer volume of this footage, you could do it two ways. You could either use proxies or you could edit in the full native 6K resolution of the camera, which is what we wanted to do. But to do it, we needed a special computer. So we got an HP Z820 uh, workstation that's got 12 Xeon cores and this machine uh, coupled with Adobe Premiere could actually handle the footage raw as it came from the camera in real time. And we did a 5-1 mix in Adobe Premiere too. One of the unique skills the team had to learn wasn't technical but artistic. How to shoot for the dome screen. In television, because the screen is relatively small, you can use different shots to direct the audience's attention where you want them to. For example, you could start a scene with a wide shot and then you draw the audience's attention closer with a medium shot and then you force them to go in tighter on the detail with a close shot. And by editing these different shots together, you can tell a story and you can direct the audience's attention where you want them to. In a bull dome film, you can't really use close-ups or tight shots. And the reason is just because they become overwhelmingly huge and in your face when you're sitting in the theater. It actually is claustrophobic. So really you have to tell your story with only two kinds of shots. You have a wide shot and a medium shot. And the medium shot really can't be that close at all. So it's a little more challenging to tell the story because you don't have as many shots to pick from and you don't have as many editing options in post. But on the flip side, the shots do run longer in a full dome film and the way the audience gets their close-ups is by looking into the frame. And it's just like being there. So you're in the theater, you're surrounded by the image and when you wanna see something closer, you do just what you do in real life. You just look closer at the thing that you wanna see. And you can do that because there is so much resolution. As an example, on our first shoot at the NBL, we were shooting uh, an astronaut that was suiting up to go into the pool, but they wouldn't let us film past this yellow line that was on the floor uh, to keep us safe from the crane. And we're behind the yellow line. I'm looking at the viewfinder thinking, we are way too far away. This shot is not gonna look good. But when we got the footage up on the dome at Skyscan and we looked at it, we realized, no, actually we weren't too far away. We were perfect. Because um, when you're on the dome, everything looks a little different than it does in a viewfinder and, and you, you can see into the frame so much better. So we had to recalibrate our style of shooting and thinking in order to imagine when we're shooting what it's gonna look like on the dome. And there was certainly a learning curve associated with that. Shooting for the dome had other issues beyond technical and aesthetic. The fisheye lens offered a wide view critical for the dome experience, but it also created problems. Underwater, the fisheye lens creates an image that's necessary for the dome. You have to have that wide angle of view in order to make it look right when you project it on a dome. But it creates a couple of problems. Your subject, which is right in front of you, is in the same frame as the surface of the water, which is directly over your head. And the problem with that is there's five or six stops of light difference, of exposure difference between those two things. And they appear in the same frame. Now, the sensor and the raw format of the red has a tremendous dynamic range and we were able to handle that difference in exposure pretty well by making sure to expose so that we don't overexpose the highlights. But the problem ended up when you project that in the dome, you end up with your subject in front of you, 
being essentially washed out by all of the light that's coming down from the top of the theater. Basically, the bright projection in the top is like someone turned on the lights in the theater and it washes everything out. So we had to do a tremendous amount of grading in post in order to deal with that huge difference in exposure and tone down the brightness at the top of the theater just so that it doesn't affect the part of the picture that we care about. With a firm handle on dome film production, the Blue World team is already developing their next film, also with an underwater theme. If the planetarium market wants to expand and rebrand itself as the full dome theater market, I think they have to start looking beyond just films about space. I believe that space will always be a very big part of the full dome market. But there are other topics that lend themselves really well to the dome, and underwater is one of them. And I think when you see Space School, you'll agree. <laughs>